to talk about the disastrous home game Man United played against Galatasaray. Disastrous home game against Galatasaray in the Champions League. Man United 2, Galatasaray 3, Galatasaray 3, Man United 2 at home. The really sad thing about this game wasn't that we got beat. The really sad thing about this game was that Galatasaray were there to be beaten. They weren't, they're not a good team. Any other team in the Champions League, any other team in our group, probably puts them away if they perform the way that they did uh, against us at Old Trafford. They're not very good. They're very open at the back. Their front line isn't probably as sharp as it needs to be. They missed a penalty, a couple of chances here and there. Um, they were getting very unnecessarily aggressive and shit in the midfield and in defense and stuff inside to do niggly fouls. So they definitely have a temperament issue. Their fans can also be easily influenced by how badly they play on the pitch. You could see at certain points. So they are there for the taking. But we played so terrible outside of the Rasmus Hoyland goals and performances. We played so terrible as a team, defending, midfield, and in, in parts of our attack, that it was only inevitable that they were eventually going to win. I thought a draw after everything that happened in the game would have been a good result. But then considering how the other teams in our, you know, in our Champions League group are playing now, I think Bayern Munich ended up winning 2-1 against um, Copenhagen and they, I think, won their first game. It's very, very difficult to see us qualifying from this group, which is obviously isn't, I don't think, a bad thing either because I'm one of the fans that doesn't really agree with this idea of top four is everything and being a Champions League is a must. I think sometimes being in these cup competitions is only worthwhile if you actually have an option or a possibility of winning just being in it for the sake of hearing the champions league music and being a part of the flipping social media conversation isn't really the greatest thing i think in general because if anything these competitions remind you way more than maybe sometimes the league of how far or your club is from the top teams around the world it really or around europe sorry it really does remind you it's a stark reminder of just how far we have to go and i think most united fans you know, Glazer protests, uh, you know, to one side and blaming them to one side and shit. You have to see that even if we get the right manager in, we've got a long way to go to get this team playing anywhere near the level that it can be to be competing in the Champions League, let alone qualifying in our group and let alone trying to win. It's fucking, we're miles apart. Um, the, obviously, the most concerning part for me, I think, has to be the way we conceded the goals. Um, obviously, Onana's mistake, um, that led to one of the goals was absolutely diabolical, especially for the penalty. Sorry, sorry. The the, 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 the mistake that led to the penalty was absolutely diabolical. Um, then the Onana attempt at trying to save the through ball that Akadi ran onto to score the winner was absolutely diabolical. Also, he went way too, you know, he went to ground way too early, made Akadi's job way easier when he went to go and score. But also, I think running that back a bit, Akadi running through the way that he did through one header from Davison Sanchez from his own half into our half and both Lindelof and Varane looking at like they were running in mud and then obviously Amrabat playing him on side which I don't really fault him for because he's a defensive midfielder playing at left back was shocking Icardi is never known for his pace but he completely stripped us at the back ran onto it and finished it really well to let them win you know at the last minute Rasmus Hoyland was one of our only positives I think maybe alongside Mason Mount I've given Mason Mount a lot of stick um, but I honestly do think this was Mason Mount's best ever performance so far playing for Man United I feel like he performed his role really well in midfield he was tenacious he was combative alongside him and um, um, Hassan Med Medjri, um who I don't think is obviously a I don't think he's a great player, but I think what he clearly does is that he plays or he so he complements the midfielders better in that kind of way that Terex and Hag wants us to play than any other midfielder, which I think goes to speak to the overall dependency that Ericsson Hogg has with his favourites that annoys me. But going back to Mount, I thought Mount played really well throughout the entirety of the game. I think maybe alongside um, Hoyland, he probably was our best player. He probably deserved to get a goal or an assist. But definitely the star man has to go to Hoyland. Rasmus Hoyland, right, that was maybe one of the best um, I've seen striker performances in a long time at United. That was everything we want to see in a modern striker. Holding up the ball, being a nuisance to the defenders, scoring goals, being a threat. He basically scored a hat-trick, but one of the goals got cancelled um, because of an offside. But he was incredible. That was such a good performance. And that should give most fans hope 
and you know maybe dissuade a little the negative feeling around Hoyland especially myself I was having my reservations about some of his runs and shit whatever it may be but there's definitely a player there the only thing is playing up front for United that we've seen with Martial as we see even with Weghorst when he was here um, it's just a, a really thankless task there's not a lot of good combination play before the ball gets to you so you're kind of relying on your striking partners or the attacking players or the midfielders having a moment of brilliance to find you there isn't a lot of combination plays where you can kind of expect to get the ball in certain places but I thought the his first goal which I think was a header from Rashford or the cross over from Rashford I think actually that ball was hit at him a little bit too hard I'm not gonna lie I think the cross in was hit too hard and hit too far back he had to kind of bend back two yards to kind of get the, the ball in from the header, which was still a flipping amazing finish regardless. Um, and then, of course, the second goal, I think, was a tapping close in on a goal that was really well taken. And then I think the second, the one that would have been the second goal that got cancelled was really good when he dummied the midfielder, sorry, the defender inside the box. But um, the defending and the midfield from us was horrible. Casemiro, probably one of the worst performances I've seen from him in a while. The ill discipline to give away the penalty like he did in a box was stupid, even though they didn't score up in a penalty because Icardi ended up missing. Him sliding in like that against the player in the box was so flipping stupid. Honestly, one of the worst um, red cards I've seen in my entire life, especially when you think about he's already on the yellow card. He's already on the he, he he he's already on the yellow card. Um, Onana obviously does the ba the worst thing possible by passing the ball straight um, from the box, trying to get to flipping Casemiro. It doesn't get to him, and then in Casemiro's effort to try to get back to stop, um, I think it's Mertens from getting into the box. He slide tackles him, and that gives away the flipping penalty. Right, an absolutely stupid error for Ca for a player of Casemiro's experience to make in the box. Crazy, and I think personally he didn't need to do that. He could have still let Mertens run into the box and attempt to try to score pass on Nana from the angle that he was at or whatever he was going to do we still had 11 men and we could go again to try to rescue a point from the game or whatever it may have been it wasn't all it wasn't all hope wasn't lost so i don't know why he did such a drastic decision to go and slide tackle him like that especially on the yellow card that ill discipline um from somebody's experience was really horrible to see i thought varan against galatasaray was very 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 bad like that was one of the most concerning performances i've seen from varan because if anything that was a that was a reminder of maybe just how far he's fallen off as a player maybe he's just not at the level that we need anymore maybe that is just the level that we're seeing of varan now is where he's at and it kind of goes back to the idea that i think a lot of fans said you know, clubs like Real Madrid don't get rid of players like or let players like Varane and Casemiro leave unless they are surplus to requirements. Those type of top teams don't really let go of those type of players unless they're no longer necessary. They're no longer needed. They're not of the you know, they're not of the appropriate kind of level to play at their level anymore. And maybe that's the reason why they ended up at United. Maybe they ended up at United because they were surplus to requirements at Real Madrid as opposed to them wanting to play at the top level still and coming to United because obviously we pay crazy wages and they know they're not going to really have any competition for a place there. So they come over here and then we end up having um, a has-been um, two players in the most crucial positions, defensive midfield and one of our centre-backs playing there. And maybe Varane also is carrying an injury. I'm not really too sure what's going on, but he looked terrible, especially alongside flipping, um, what's his thing, uh, Lindelof, who's always bad especially when he's playing against strikers or attacking players who are dynamic and do crazy stuff um a lot of credit goes to flipping Wilfred Zaha for his first goal again he played for us a long time ago he had a really bad time uh, at United various conspiracy theories around why he didn't exactly hit the ground running maybe his you know beef with David Moyes and the whole drama allegedly behind David Moyes daughter and shit was not true who knows but it didn't go well for him at United and it's nice to see that he's been able to kind of resurrect his career at Crystal Palace and then get his big move to a Champions League club which he always wanted playing for Galatasaray and then he came to back to the club and was able to silence the boot boys and score the opening goal the only issue i have with it is that dallo should never ever 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 allow flipping zaha to do what he did to him for that goal that is not that is just not acceptable the ball gets again long balls into the area it, it felt like we're playing a sunday league club honestly the way the goals that were scored with the with the exception of the 
one of the oh the good goal actually even a good goal that was a fucking one two on the side that Amrabat missed that also felt like a sign because it was very easy um very kind of formulaic and easy to predict type of thing you'd imagine players that kind of level would have been able to stuff that out but regardless long boot through the middle um then kind of bounces and again if you know if you played at any level of football Sunday league semi pro you know you're not ever meant to let the ball bounce especially when it's near your box Dalo does and by that point um Zaha expertly pins him back, uses him as a shield, and then as the ball's bouncing up in the box, he then is able to volley it into the ground and it loops over flipping Onana. I have an issue with Onana and his positioning for the goal. I feel like the only way Zaha was going to score that was by doing that volley into the ground so that it would hit the ground and pivot over his head. I feel like he should have positioned himself a little bit further back into the goal to be able to push the ball over the flipping bar. But Onana is very suspect so far. I'm very disappointed with Onana because I think Onana, we had this idea that he was going to flip and replace um, De Gea in the goal and be a better flipping goalkeeper and shit. And he was going to be able to play out from the back because he's better with the ball at his feet. But from what we've seen so far, Onana is a very much average shot stopper as a goalkeeper. And he's also not that great with the ball at his feet. He's always got a mistake in him always and I think the mistake that led to the penalty wasn't even a high pressure situation I don't think he could have I don't think he was kind of pushed into a corner and he had only one option to go to but to pass it straight to flipping Casemiro that was just an again maybe a lack of concentration maybe his confidence is low that's a really frustration and worrying part of it it's not even like he's doing risque things to try to advance us off the pitch by doing Cruyff turns and trying to do risque passes that would have if it worked out that would have been amazing no it's a fairly simple I feel like place like where he receives the ball here he could have easily passed it out to the sides he could have easily kicked it out and he decides to pass it straight and it goes into the path of flipping Mertens, who runs onto it. And by that time, Casemiro is too late to try to get the ball back. And finally, finally, we have to talk about the two of my most despised players currently playing for fucking Man United at the moment, Bruno Fernandes and flipping Marcus Rashford. Bruno Fernandes at the moment is playing so badly, it's making me question, what is the point of training at professional football clubs? Surely, just because you are on paper the best player and because in the past you have amazing stats, if you're not playing well at this current moment, why can't you get dropped? Why is Eric Ten Hag incapable of dropping this guy, of subbing him off, of maybe giving him a break out of the limelight, giving him a break out of playing all the time and playing somebody else to maybe try to, you know, have this competition for places thing going on. So maybe he can maybe feel a little bit motivated to come on and play and try his best or maybe try to resurrect his form. What's happening with our club that we're incapable of benching such a average, I feel like, player? You don't win Champions Leagues and Premier League titles with a player like Bruno Fernandes anyway. It's not as if he's a top, top echelon player, in my personal opinion. So why aren't we capable of just benching him? That's the thing that I don't understand because he's playing so badly today. Yes, he had to play on the right wing. He didn't play in his favourite centre midfield, which again is an issue in these high profile games in the Champions League or the games that really matter. For whatever reason, Ericsson Hall prefers to have Bruno Fernandes playing on the right as some sort of makeshift winger that can tuck in from time to time. That maybe says a lot about his inability to maybe play in that role. I'm not really sure. But his tendency to shoot when he needs to pass, to pass when he needs to shoot, it's just annoying the hit and hope balls, the inability to kind of really control the ball and dictate the flow of the game and tend to just kind of just get out of his feet first time and always go for the long ball. It's so fucking frustrating. It really is frustrating how it is. Honestly, I absolutely deplore it and I don't know why in this position. And then the other player, who's also going to be the reason why most likely Eric Ten Hag will get sacked, is Marcus Rashford himself. Marcus Rashford is playing so badly right now, you're almost questioning. It's almost making you realise, actually, why flipping Jaden Sancho is refusing to apologise to Eric Ten Hag. I get it. I get why Jaden Sancho is refusing to apologise to Eric Ten Hag because if you're Jaden Sancho and you think you're training well, but the manager doesn't, cool, whatever, difference of opinion, but then you see Marcus Rashford pulling up absolute stinkers week in, week out, but still getting picked, you're going to have an issue with this idea that, oh, if you train well, that's how I pick you. Because clearly, he's not only getting picked because of training, he's getting picked because of his past form. 
from last year, from last season, that probably helped keep, you know, Erickson Hag in a job and obviously re recover the season. Fair enough. He did a lot last season. But now he's playing horrendous. And for whatever reason, he keeps getting rewarded and keeps playing. And I absolutely despise it. It's one of the things that really annoys me the most about this modern day United are these mediocre and average players who I feel like feel like they're entitled to play and to start for the club. They feel like they're way better than what they actually are and they're a detriment to the overall culture of our team because what's happening, I feel like having played, again, only at Sunday league level, but I know because I was never really that great at football, but when I was playing... I knew that sometimes if players were being ahead of me just because of the relationship with the manager or whatever it may be, it would definitely not help my motivation when it came to training. And I will remember because I was always on the bench, you'd always hear dissatisfaction from players on the bench because the players that were playing in front of them, they didn't feel like were that better than that much better than them and they were only playing because of favoritism. That can be a very destructive um, thing to have in the dressing room. You have to get rid of it instantly. You can't have players feeling like they're above getting dropped like they're entitled to always play. That isn't the right way to go about things. Even if you don't have options, I don't think it's the right way to go. I don't agree with it because I feel like football should always is a team sport at the end of the day. Unless you're at the top echelons where you've got actual game changers who can actually change the game for you at a drop of a dime. For the most part, you're relying on your teammate to do something to help you in order to help the team. If that's the case, get the best person for the role, put them in place there and let it go from there. But for some reason, it doesn't really happen. And at United, I think now we're in a position where Ericsson Haag is really in a weird position now because all those things that he should have done, those strong positions he should have made or decisions he should have made with certain players in our team, like whether or not to give Bruno Fernandes the captaincy, whether or not to fucking persist with Rashford, keeping Martial, um, the defenders, Maguire, all these people that have stood around there, all these things he should have done in the first season. That's what strong managers do. They come in, they drop. You know, it's the famous Pep Guardiola and Joe Hart thing in Man City. You come in in Man City, you drop uh, Joe Hart, um, who's the main goalkeeper there because he doesn't play the way that you want to play. And then it kind of sets a precedent. Everybody's on a chopping block. I want to play a certain way. If you don't match that way, you're kind of out of that club. All those things you should have done in the beginning, he hasn't done now. So now he's in the position where he's having to decide, should I pick a fight? Should I pick a war with these players who are popular in the dressing room, who have friends in the media that can undermine me and who have clearly down tools already and can influence the fucking you know, atmosphere in the changing room? He's already in a bad position already because he, didn't, he wasn't strong enough in the beginning. And now you have players such as Donny van der Beek and all these other players who are probably sitting there thinking to themselves, how can I not get into a Champions League squad when you're playing these guys week in, week out? These guys aren't that much better than me. You sell Fred, and he's probably thinking to himself, are these guys really that much better than me? You sell fucking De Gea because he's surplus to requirements. De Gea's probably sitting there thinking, for all I've done for the club, do I deserve to get binned the way that I did, did, did get binned? That's the thing that is really at the crux of it. Like, And I'm not really too sure when it comes to Eric Ten Hag if it's just fucking stubbornness is what's leading to him not wanting to sub and to bench certain players, or if he genuinely feels like the results won't change, the performances won't change with different players, when we've seen it has. We played a different midfield, a different kind of team against Crystal Palace in the League Cup, and we got a better performance, even though the players weren't maybe as good as the players he'd want to naturally start. It worked better for us as a team. Then he scraps it immediately as soon as the better players come back fit again. And then we go back to playing shit and we go back to losing. Or we go back to playing just rubbish and having poor performances. It's not good enough. And I feel like now with this whole mood around the club and stuff and the lack of you know information when it comes to the ownership change, he's really on a hide into nothing because the Glazers won't want negative press. They'll eventually, in order to protect themselves, they'll eventually just fire him and just get somebody else in again. And the cycle then continues. So as much as I don't want him to get fired because I feel like it will take the attention away from the Glazers, it's also getting to the point where you're thinking to yourself like, what are you doing with these guys in training? We're not seeing any style of play, no patterns of play. We're not really seeing plays being improved on. We're not really seeing a, even just the, the Hoyland, um, even the Hoyland fucking signing. It feels like he's figuring it out on his own. I don't feel like we actually have played in a way that suits him. You know, personally, I don't think so. We have really patterns of play that really suit him. He's having to just figure out on his way and kind of help his teammates understand his game more as the game kind of progresses. And that's basically it. So we're in a really shitty position, but Ericsson Hager really needs to really fix up and work it out ASAP. If not, he is fucked. But 
this match was one of those ones that kind of just reminded me of how far we are. And I wouldn't say it broke me because I think I've been broken already. I've just kind of given up kind of caring, even though I've been rambling for more than 20 minutes. I wouldn't say it's broken me in that regard, but it definitely has led me to believe that this club is just toxic from top to bottom. The players, the managers, there's something about this club that just turns good players into terrible players that makes competent managers lose the plot because this Eric Ten Hag that we saw at Ajax isn't the same guy we're seeing now at United. The principles that he had at Ajax, the way that he played football was completely different. The player profiles that he had in the team are completely different. Like, what is going on? I really don't understand what the deal is. I really don't get it. I would love to know. But for some reason, we are where we are and I feel like it's only going to get worse before it gets better unfortunately for United fans it really is the case and I for one can't wait for us to get knocked out of Champions League because we don't need to be in this competition getting our asses handed to us by Galatasaray at home it's not worth it I'd rather not play it I'd rather even not be in the Europa League fuck it scrap it concentrate on the league concentrate on actually you know training these players and coaching them correctly you know developing some players if, if need be and then going again next season but this whole just being in competition for the sake of it to feel like we're a top club where we're, we're far from being one is not it. And these players are a fucking embarrassment. Every single one of that played, with the exception of Hoyland and maybe Mason Mount, they're all fucking disgraces. And it's I can't imagine how annoying it must have been to be a United fan watching that game in person at Old Trafford with it raining and shit and seeing a mediocre Galatasaray side dunking on us the way they did. Fuck all of them. Honestly, what a terrible, terrible performance. And I can't wait until the season is over already and we get new owners. I hopefully we hopefully do get new owners soon. The guys just haven't fucking confirmed what's going on at the moment. There's some rumblings about um, you know, um Jim the Ratcliffe um kind of coming in with a minority stake option to buy the club, which is a nightmare. But I obviously want the other um Saudis to come in or whatever to buy us out. Sheikh Jassim, sorry, hopefully. Because it's going to be a hundred percent buyout, and that's what we need. We need to. We just need the cultural reboot. We need to change from top to bottom. And I hope when the new owners come in, they get rid of everybody. They fire the entire board and start from scratch. We need that. We're desperate for it because at the moment, the people that we have currently managing or controlling our club don't know what they're doing, man. They really don't. It's fucking perplexing. I fucking hate it. I hate United so fucking much. With all my fucking heart.